Alberta. Oh my goodness, why thank you. Thank you for that very warm welcome. You guys are awesome. Let me tell you else, who else is awesome. My, my, my cabinet and caucus are awesome who, uh, too, and so many of them are here with you this morning, although I gather it was a pretty late night last night, as it is for uh, these kinds of events. So I'm glad to see you here bright and early this morning. We've got Nathan Newdorf, who is, of course, our Minister of Affordability and Utilities, Ron Weeb from Grand Prairie Area, same with Todd Lowen. He's also our Forestry and, and, um, and Parks Minister. We've got Mohammed Yassin with Immigration and Multi culturalism. You guys can stand so people know where you are. Uh, we've got Tanya Fur, who's our Arts and Culture Minister, Mickey Amory, of course, Justice. We've got uh, Rick McIver. He'll be on the hot seat, I think, tomorrow, our Minister of Municipal Affairs. Cyril Turton, who is our Children and Family Services. Rajan Sani, Advanced Education. Rick Wilson, Indigenous Relations. Devin Dreeshan, who is Transportation Economic Corridors. Demetrios Nicolaides, who is our Minister of Education. And, of course, Rebecca Schultz, who is our uh, Minister who is the critic for Stephen Guibault, and she's very busy on that file, I can tell you that. Um, but she is also our Minister of Environment and Protected Areas. Give them all a round of applause for being here with you this morning. <laughs> And thanks, Paul, again for the introduction. It's such an honor to be with you here today alongside all of my cabinet and caucus colleagues. Our government always welcomes every chance we get to connect with municipal leaders in Alberta because we're partners, we're compatriots. And through our combined efforts, we defend this province's unparalleled quality of life and improve things for everyone who lives here. When I'm in a room with you and talking about Alberta, I know that we are all on the same side. So let me just start with a few words about this province that we all love. There is something here for everyone. We have world-class cities with every urban amenity imaginable. We've got smaller cities and towns with close-knit communities and plenty of charm and character in every corner of our province. And we've got a spectacular heartland with wide open prairies dark spruce forests and rolling foothills. And that's Alberta. That's why millions of tourists come here every year to see it and to experience it. For the over 700,000 Albertans that you represent, that of course is their idea of paradise. And for all of us, that is home. There are so many reasons someone would prefer living in rural Alberta. Take the people of my riding, of Brooks Medicine Hat. These are some of the most freedom-loving folks I've ever met. They live where they live because they want the blue skies above them and the neighbors that they know by name. And they wouldn't want to live anywhere else on earth. My riding covers all of Newell County and a nice chunk of Cypress County, and it supports a highly productive agriculture industry, oil and natural gas operations, and small businesses. And it's got some of the most stunning scenery found anywhere in Alberta. And these are just two of the rural municipalities of the 69 that RMA represents. And it's just a small part of Alberta. There are thriving communities, dynamic industries, and of course, hidden gems everywhere. And if you've ever had the honor of attending question period in, leg in the legislature, you'll have also heard the ongoing friendly battle between rural MLAs rising and claiming to represent the most beautiful riding in the entire province. But let me settle that once and for all, I have that honor. So, yeah. <laughs> but I will acknowledge the competition is very close and every MLA has verifiable reasons to back up their claims and RMA does a tremendous job of advocating for these vital communities which of course uh, bringing, bringing us all together at these conventions twice a year is part of that advocacy and as usual it does look like you have a jam-packed agenda in store with discussions ranging from wildfires and public safety to infrastructure and red tape and I know that again the Minister of Municipal Affairs, Rick McIver, will be speaking to you all tomorrow to share some of the items that are on our fall legislative agenda and how they may affect municipalities. So this morning, I do want to focus on some of the broad priorities that we're working on that will benefit every Albertan and position our province for success, we believe, far into the future. So let's start with a, a quick look at our economic picture. Our province is doing great right now. Alberta has, has Canada's highest per capita business investment. And we have seen major investments in Alberta's industrial heartland, which is great news for the people of Strathcona County. They have, there's a new data center that's being built in Rocky View County and a new power plant that is slated for construction in Woodlands County. 
There is a huge new flour mill being built in Red Deer County, a carbon capture investment proposed for Medicine Hat, and agri-food investments in Brooks. And of course, with the completion of the TMX pipeline and the near uh, completion of LNG Canada, our energy industry is growing again. And it isn't just energy. Uh, uh, or the Alberta economy that is growing. It is the whole province. If the benefits of living in Alberta were ever a secret, well, the secret's out now, and people are coming here in huge numbers. And in the long run, of course, this growth is fantastic for our province. However, you know and we know that it's placing, in the short term, major strain on our public services. That's why we're, uh, we, we, we've been adding, we discovered, about 33,000 students annually, which is enough to fill 35 new schools every year. When we tabled our budget in the spring, we allocated around $2 billion over three years for new school construction. That would add around 35,000 new student spaces in total, but we found out very quickly from our school boards that we need far more than that. That's why we announced our school construction accelerator program earlier this year. Over the next three budgets, we're prioritizing the construction of up to 90 new schools along with 24 modernizations or replacements. We're also expanding the modular classroom program and supporting the expansion of public charter schools. Our actions will create more than 200,000 new and modernized school spaces over the next seven years. And when we're finished, we'll be able to better accommodate our growing population. And of course, we wouldn't be able to do any of this without our municipal partners. And I'm, I'm sure you heard me say during our announcement of this program that we were asking our municipalities to do what you could to identify and prepare school sites with permitting and zoning and servicing. And we have been impressed with the response that we've gotten so far as we move forward with this important work and I want to thank you all for making our jobs easier. Now I know most of you also will be starting the budgeting process soon just like we are. To alleviate some of the funding pressure on our municipalities our government is lowering the cost of borrowing. When our credit rating gets better we get access to lower rates so we're passing that on as well to you. We're also committed to providing predictable and sustainable funding levels for municipalities. That's why we replaced the Municipal Sustainability Initiative with the new local government fiscal framework. The new framework is tied into provincial revenue changes so that means it will keep funding levels sustainable. So for this fiscal year, uh, the new framework is providing more than $700 million in capital, capital grants and $2.4 billion over three years in local infrastructure priorities. Our aim with these changes is to give municipalities more certainty in your planning. And we could all use a bit more certainty, of course, as winter descends on Alberta. And the return of winter means the return of Alberta's cruel retail carbon tax as Albertans fire up their natural gas furnaces for the season. Natural gas is amazing. It's inexpensive, we have huge amounts of it, and it is a relatively low emission fuel source. But Albertans pay three times as much for the federal carbon tax on natural gas as they do for the natural gas itself. Meanwhile, people out east are using heating oil which is a much higher emitting fuel, and they've been gifted with a three-year tax holiday from this crushing tax. It's not right, it's not fair, and we're fighting it. So last week, yeah. So last week, uh, along with uh, Minister Mickey Amory, we announced that we filed an application with the federal court to have the heating oil exemption for Atlantic Canada declared unlawful and unconstitutional. Now, of course, the purpose of that is we want to re end the retail carbon tax altogether, but we think they made a mistake in doing this particular carve out. It completely undermines their argument about why they needed to have a national floor price altogether. Uh, we know that Ottawa, Ottawa's retail carbon tax never made sense, and we crunched the numbers on what it is costing our province, and you wouldn't believe the scale of it. Because although they like to talk about the rebates that are going back to individuals, the rebates don't come back to school boards or to hospitals or to municipalities. And so we've done a little bit of math on this, so let me give an example from Rocky View. Since the carbon tax was imposed in 2019, the Rocky View Public School Division has sent the Canada Revenue Agency more than $2.3 million. That money could hire a lot of teachers, it could fund a lot of field trips, it could buy a whole bunch of art supplies. Uh, and let's take a look at another county. The Parkland Public School Division has remitted more than 1.7 million in the carbon tax since 2019. And how much have they received as a rebate? Not a dime. 
I could go on and on with each of the different school boards. We costed it out division by division, but you get the idea, and I can tell you this, by 2030, the school boards will be paying $61 million a year in carbon tax. That's the equivalent of 495 teachers. We looked at what it would cost our health system. It's the equivalent of 981 nurses. We'd love to have RMA tell us how much it is costing you. The only data we were able to get from the cities was Calgary. And Calgary in 2023 alone paid enough carbon tax that would have allowed them to hire 121 police officers or firefighters. So if you can work with us so that we can get the numbers for the RMA going out to 2030, we'll continue to advocate not only for the school boards and our hospitals, but also for you as well. Uh, the impacts of this tax really are just enormous, and we're just at the beginning because, as we all know, these costs are going to continue to increase unless we stand up to the federal government, and that's exactly what we're doing. We're standing up for you on carbon tax, fuel regulations that make home heating more expensive, and on, of course, the oil and gas emissions cap, which we all know is really just a production cap, and we're certainly going to not let them get away with that. They just announced it yesterday, out of the blue. Uh, in case you, uh, if you haven't seen some of the work that we've done on this, we've got a $7 million ad campaign going on in Ottawa right now, letting them know the devastating effect it would have, not only on Alberta, but the entire country. It would cost our economy $28 billion. The entire national economy would be, would suffer by, uh, to the tune of $97 billion. It would cost 150,000 jobs across the country. And if you look at what s and Global said, by having such a rigid emissions cap requirement by 2030, the only way to achieve it would be to shut in one million barrels of production. That would be the equivalent of three to seven billion dollars in royalty revenues for our province. So think about all of the things that we would not be able to fund. I think our entire roads and bridges program is 2.2 billion dollars to give you an idea of the scale of what it is that they're imposing on us. Uh, but it is unconstitutional and we are going to fight it. We are also working to protect Alberta's rights and freedoms. The last time we put laws on the books to protect these cherished values was 1972. And of course, the world has changed a lot in the 50 years since then. That's why we're updating the Alberta Bill of Rights. If passed, our amendments will strengthen it, bring it into step with the 21st century, and lock in protections for Alberta, Albertans' rights and freedoms. These amendments include uh, protection of property rights, including the right to just compensation, freedom of expression, freedom of bodily autonomy. It also includes protecting Albertans' right to legally own and use firearms for hunting and sport and on the farm. If passed, our work on the Alberta Bill of Rights will ensure that the province remains one of the freest societies in the world. We have a lot, yeah. We have a lot to protect in this province, and our quality of life is among the best you will find anywhere on earth, and our government is, is committed to defending it with everything we've got. So for the Albertans you represent, that means defending a way of life whose purpose has barely changed in generations, to live freely on their own slice of this amazing province. And RMA does such important work to preserve this way of life. And you can count on our government to do the same. Thank you for inviting me to join you today. And let's get into some questions.